Hello, I'm Mark Mazzetti. I'm a Washington correspondent for the New York Times. It's a pleasure to be a, a moderator for this esteemed panel. I am uh, uh, pleased to uh, introduce uh, my, uh, my two panelists. Uh, first off, Bilahari Kasakhan, the former permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for Singapore and the chairman of the National University of Singapore uh, Middle East Institute. Uh, my second panelist, uh, John Brennan, who uh, was the CIA director under President Obama, and before that was President Obama's top counterterrorism advisor in the White House. Thought we'd jump right in uh, to the discussion um, with a sort of provocative intro. Um, the title of this panel is the transition from counterterrorism to great power competition, challenges, opportunities, and strategic impact. And neither of the panelists um, believe that the title is right. Um, so let me first start out um, with um, Bilahari and, um, and, and have you talk about this idea um, of, of this transition uh, to great power competition and some of the issues you have with how it's currently framed. Well, the way the title is framed, from counterterrorism to great power competition, kind of implies quite strongly that there was a phase of terrorism, where the terrorism is the main problem, and now great power competition is the main problem. I don't see great power competition as ever having stopped. Right? And terrorism, there are high points, there are low points, but, low points, but it stems from the deepest recesses of human nature. It's always there. It's like a chronic disease that you have to take care of throughout as long as you are alive. So I think it's profoundly misleading to think that this was where we have to deal only with terrorism and this is now we have to deal only with great power competition. You have to do both simultaneously and we have always had to do both all the time. John. I agree with Bilahari. Uh, particularly if you're looking at sort of the, the global landscape um, and how over time we have to deal with terrorism problems, proliferation problems, great power competition. There's a lot that's going on. I would add, though, that it, a lot depends on where you sit. Uh, and I'm sure that in the agencies, for example, in the United States, like the CIA, that has had a very leading role on counterterrorism, and a lot of resources have been dedicated to the counterterrorism mission, especially since 9-11, uh, there is a, a gradual change that has to take place uh, in order to ensure that the agency is pursuing and addressing the priorities of the different administrations that it serves. And so from that PRISM's perspective of CIA, there's probably a shift of resources, of energy, of effort, of personnel, to try to look at some of these other issues that become more important and more of a priority for administrations. But like Bilahari says, the tourism challenge is not going away. Uh, it will ebb and flow depending on the different landscapes, for example, in the Middle East with ISIS and Al Qaeda and others. But that great power competition takes on new perspectives uh, or, or new uh, dimensions as China has become much more ascendant over the last decade or two. Uh, and therefore, the competition and even conflict with the, the United States um, becomes more of a concern uh, to the administrations uh, in Washington. So again, I, I do not believe we have this transition that it goes from one to the other. It is a question of how are you going to balance all of those competing or those areas that you need to address and do it in a manner that does not um, uh, lead to uh, neglect of one or the other, but uh, uh, applies the appropriate attention, focus, and resources to the issues as they continue to evolve. Okay, so great power competition never went away, and terrorism is never going away. So there is now this um, balancing act, as John, you just said, uh, a question of prioritizing, a question of resources. Um, you uh, just brought up um, the, uh, 
sort of the tension uh, inside of a bureaucracy like the CIA uh, about what about how you focus on different things. When you were CIA director, you tried to sort of start a, um, a transition uh, to um, to look at uh, uh, the so-called great powers, uh, where um, obviously the CIA never stopped looking at them, but the attention. Um, to the counterterrorism mission of the CIA um, was so central to the agency in the post 9-11 years. I'm wondering how you felt, you know, by the time you left, um, how much progress you'd made in, in, in refocusing the agency and what are some of the sort of inherent tensions uh, when, you know, the agency reports to the president and, and ultimately what the president wants the agency to focus on is what the agency is gonna focus on. Well, by the time I left the CIA, Al Qaeda's uh, terrorist uh, network was diminished significantly with the, the killing of bin Laden, uh, the taking off of the battlefield of many of those terrorist operatives. Um, but yet you had ISIS that emerged uh, in Iraq and Syria and then carried out a number of terrorist attacks in different places. And that's one of the challenges in counterterrorism. Uh, yes, you have to deal with a lot of the groups that are um, mo of most concern at a particular time, but yet there continues to be sort of an evolution of that, that terrorist dimension that you deal with. Um, while I was at the agency, I tried to make sure that we were um, following through with President Obama's uh, pivot toward Asia and the concern about uh, China and uh, the various areas of, of uh, competition that we had in tension to make sure that we had the collection and the analytic capabilities uh, to address those uh, concerns. In each administration, there is a process whereby the priorities of the new administration are identified and then shared in the interagency. And then the intelligence community has a process called the, the National Intelligence Priorities Framework, where they look at those policy priorities of the administration and then adapt the intelligence programs accordingly. And so with each administration, they go through that process. And I'm sure that during the first year of the Biden administration, there was the reprioritization of issues to align with President Biden's view of what the United States needed to focus on globally. And then the intelligence community, the CIA, NSA, and other agencies would need to then uh, uh, coordinate their efforts to make sure that their collection, analytic, and other capabilities are directed um, along to align with those policy priorities. So again, I think there's a regular process in, where in the United States uh, government uh, to ensure that the both the strategic and the tactical intelligence capabilities are um, aligned in a manner that best enables the intelligence community to support policymakers on their main priorities. Let me just stay with the state CIA for a second, because um, you know, in recent days, the agency announced. Um, a reorganization, uh, stand, standing up a China mission center um, for um, the uninitiated, um, you know, is this, you know, merely creating a, um, a, a new bureaucracy to show that you're attacking a problem? How does it actually, um, you know, how does, the, how does the creation of something like this show priority uh, towards, you know, China as um, this global power increasing amount of U.S. attention it gets? Um, what does it really mean for an agency like CIA? Well, when I was director of CIA, we reorganized the structure of the agency to pull together the different capabilities of the agency into mission centers. And there were 10 mission centers. Six of them were regional uh, and four of them were functional. And so for in the regional center, we had East Asia, the East Asia mission center that China was nested within. Now, over time, I think we realize uh, in, the, in the U.S. government that China poses a very, very uh, important and, and uh, challenging uh, issue for the intelligence community and for CIA. And so what Director Bill Burns did, and I think it's appropriate, um, has made China its own mission center. So you have the collection, the technical, the analytic and other types of capabilities integrated in a single country mission center. That mission center will coordinate with the other mission centers to make sure that we understand what is happening on the global stage in terms of China's activities. But uh, I, again, I just think this is an effort to try to emphasize the importance of China. And again, that mission center construct is designed to allow directors uh, and presidents 
to ensure that the CIA is postured in a manner that is able to address as effectively and efficiently as possible some of these uh, evolving priorities. So I, I do think the China Mission Center is going to allow the agency to uh, continue to uh, follow uh, developments on the China front and provide the support to the policymakers that uh, they need. Bill Hari, um, we've just talked about the you know, increased emphasis um, in the new administration in the United States under um, on China, on the competition with China um, uh, between the United States and, and China. You've written a great deal, obviously, not just about the uh, US-China relationship, but um, how China is, uh, the relationship between China and other nations in Asia. Um, I'm wondering to start out the discussion or to expand the conversation on China, how um, in your region right now, um, countries and leaders are seeing um, this, uh, the, the rhetoric and some of the initial policy moves by the Biden administration towards China, and maybe as a direct comparison to the previous administration under Donald Trump. Well, let me say this. Um, the US president who first labeled China a strategic competitor was actually George W. Bush uh, during his campaign. Then of course 9-11 happened and you know, understandably the focus shifted. But China was there. It's not a new thing. It's not suddenly that China, you, you woke up one morning and you looked around and you suddenly saw this big moth, you know? You have always been dealing with it. And that's probably uh, much more evident to somebody from a small country in Southeast Asia, which is where the, the interests of great powers, including China, including the United States have always intersected and sometimes collided. So we have always been extremely concerned about this and aware about this. Uh, it's understandable because we are a small country. Our, our interests are focused on one spot. Whereas you are a global superpower, your, your interest shifts from day to day, from month to month, from year to year. Now, I think it was uh, after the distraction, a long distraction in the Middle East, you refocus on what is the main challenge. Terrorism, I think we now understand, is extremely dangerous. We always have to deal with it. We always have to take precautions. But it is not an existential threat to any properly constituted state. They can cause a lot of damage. They can cause a lot of trouble. But they don't threaten any properly constituted state in the way that great power competition, if it is mishandled, can be extremely, can be an existential challenge, not just to the principles, but more pertinently and more dangerously and more immediately to small countries in between, like mine. Uh, from that perspective, I think it's, uh, it's understandable that there was a refocusing to China. I don't see in substance too much difference as yet between Mr. Biden's uh, approach towards China and Mr. Trump's. Of course, Mr. Biden has a more orderly, a more traditional uh, approach towards decision making, towards communication, uh, and uh, less histronics, more orderly, and that's all to be welcome. But in its essence, in its core, it seems to me it's essentially the same approach so far at least. Uh, Mr. Biden has promised a more consultative approach to um, allies, and that's all again to be welcome. But I have, as I have been reminding people uh, in my country and in my own region, the reason uh, the United States wants to consult with you is not because you're all such good looking and charming people, but because they want to find out what you are prepared to do with them on the key challenge. And you have to define some parameters for that. Now, in Southeast Asia, Singapore has defined those parameters long ago. Uh, from 1990, 2005, we had a strategic partnership agreement with the United States, we define those parameters. There are certain things we will do with you in our own interest and certain things, sorry, we are not gonna do with you. And that's fair enough, right? But I see an essential continuity. Uh, frankly, uh, and don't misunderstand me, uh, when it was quite clear that Mr. Biden was going to win the election and be the next president of the United States, one concern that I think many countries in, um, in, in my region in the larger region from Northeast Asia down to Southeast Asia, including allies like Japan had, was this going to be uh, 
the second Obama administration redux. Because the second Obama administration to us was clearly very reluctant to use hard power. Uh, and that had an effect. When Mr. Obama drew a red line in Syria and failed to enforce it, it friends and adversaries of the United States throughout the world took notice. When Mr. Trump, however crudely, incoherently, and perhaps even accidentally, showed that he was prepared to talk and use hard power, when he bombed Syria while having dinner with Mr. Xi Jinping, again, friends and adversaries of the United States stood up and took notice. So we were a bit concerned. Is this going to be Obama, second Obama redux? But it was quite clear that uh, the people in the Biden administration were quite conscious of this. And most of the initial actions they did was meant to, I think, assuage those, those concerns in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, in the Taiwan Straits. Now, I think we are moving to a new phase, if you would just give me one more second. Mm -hmm. Take your time. I think both sides have decided to try to lower the temperature a little bit. Right? I don't think it's going to change the fundamental dynamic, which is still going to be strategic competition, but, you know, Mr. Obama and Mr. C is going to have some kind of virtual meeting. Some of the other issues try to lower the temperature, but you know it's going to be the same. And it's natural. In fact, it's all, it is some of the illusions that Americans, bless your heart, had about China, that particularly after the 2001 ascension to the WTO, that they will somehow, after reform and opening up, not become just like us, but more like us. But there's a fact about China that people uh, forget. It's a communist country, of course. Not in its ideology anymore. You probably find more Marxist-Leninists in American universities than in China. But it is certainly a Leninist country in its political structure. And from that derives many of the essential behaviors that many countries around the world find objectionable. But John, I'm guessing you might want to respond on the points about the Obama administration. But before that, I wanted to press you a little bit, Bilahari, on this point. Um, and it echoes uh, something you wrote in Foreign Affairs uh, earlier this year. And you say the atmospherics of U.S. diplomacy will improve after the bluster and chaos of the Trump years. All of this will be welcome, but it will be not, but it will be for not if the US foreign policy lapses back into Obama's reluctance to use hard power. Now, you raised one example of the Trump administration's decision to bomb Syria. And I'm wondering, you know, it is said sometimes that Obama's decision uh, not to bomb uh, in Syria after the so-called red line um, uh, made people think that uh, the, you know, the US wasn't, uh, backing up its threats with force and that the U.S. lost credibility and that you seem to imply that Trump's decision gained credibility uh, for the United States, at least vis-a-vis -vis how the Chinese looked at it. And I wondered to see what do you mean by that? And I, if I've distorted it. I'll give you another like, example. No. I'll give you another example, right? Um, Ash Carter, when he was Secretary of Defense, started explicitly doing phone ops. I mean, you do phone ops all the time everywhere around the world, nothing new. But in the South China Sea, he said, we are going to do a phone op to establish a certain principle which the Chinese were challenging. And that's a principle that's in many countries' interests, not just US interests. However, in the second Trump administration, every time there was a phone op, there was a very public, almost metaphysical quarrel uh, between the NSC and the Defense Department, whether a phone op was really a phone op. And, and of course, that negated its effect. Uh, I remember I was still kind of like towards the end of my government service telling my American friends, just do it, you know. You don't have to announce it even, just do it because, and don't have a quarrel about, don't have a metaphysical debate about when is a phone op, not a phone op, and so on. Just do it, and people who need to know will notice. Give you another example. Uh, one of the reasons for the reluctance of the second. Obama administration, I'm not talking about the first, the first was fine, right? Uh, reluctance to use uh, hard power. And don't forget all the issues in what we call now the Indo-Pacific are hard power issues, essentially, the, the, the flashpoints, huh? uh, was the need to get Chinese cooperation on climate change. 
Now, I thought that was really silly because countries do not cooperate on issues as favors to each other. They cooperate because it was in their interest. And if it was in China's interest to do something about climate change because the environment was becoming a domestic problem in China, uh, uh, which was causing the Chinese Communist Party certain concerns about their own people, they would have done it anyway. You don't have to restrain your competition just because you needed the, the cooperation on this issue. It is in their interest. If it's in their interest, they will cooperate. If it's not in their interest, no matter how much you bend bad words, they won't. It's simple as that. But this kind of like international relations 101 was, uh, seemed to be missed by some people, not everybody, in the second Obama administration. I could go on giving you other examples, but I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Okay, John, you were a senior member of the uh, Obama administration uh, in both terms, and I wanted to uh, get you to, to sort of speak to what Bilahari just said about how uh, Obama's decision making was viewed um, in the region and, and as, as he sees it. Well, with all due respect, I disagree with Bilahari on a number of points. First, um, in international negotiations, uh, frequently, uh, you will proceed, uh, pursue a process whereby concessions can be made by one side or the other side. That's the whole purpose of negotiation. And so negotiating with China, even on things like the climate accord, what you do is you try to push your uh, adversary or others to make concessions that you believe are important to make. And sometimes you have to make concessions yourself. And so you're not, you're not going to just stick with your opening position so I, I do think that national interests certainly are going to be preserved, but at the same time, I think there's flexibility there in terms of what nations are willing to do. Uh, and then in terms of the Obama administration. One second, let them finish and then we'll have another response. Okay. And then the Obama administration's reluctance, uh, according to Bill Ahari, to use hard power. When I think about the Obama administration's efforts on the counterterrorism front, uh, engagement in Afghanistan, um, in Libya, and other places. And I think that there, you know, a lot of people believe that uh, President Obama's decision not to follow through with that red line threat was a sign of weakness. I don't agree. Uh, when he made that uh, statement, uh, he was very serious about taking action against Syria in the event of the use of chemical weapons. Uh, but then the Russians came forward and said that they were willing to work with the United States to get Syria to destroy its chemical weapons arsenal. And so that was a new factor that the Obama administration took into account. The Syrian chemical weapons arsenal had been a very much of a concern to the United States, to Israel and others for many, many years. And the fact that they were able to reach some type of accord where there was going to be this monitored and overseeing destruction of chemical weapons I think was certainly something that was considered to be very attractive to the Obama White House. And so then rather than carry out some strikes, military strikes against chemical weapon sites, that would have unknown implications as far as the, the spewing of, of chemicals in the, in the air and what it would do as far as maybe bringing Russia into that conflict in an active way. I, I do think that President Obama wanted to pursue a policy and a path that was going to have the, the greatest positive impact and having a Syrian chemical weapons destruction process underway, I think that's what he opted for. And so I, I know that a lot of people, you know, criticize the failure to follow through on it, but I must say that I think President Obama had a very judicious use of hard power, tried to make sure that the United States was not gonna be reckless and the fact that Donald Trump would carry out a strike, I think, yes, it was no, uh, noted by both adversaries and, and partners and allies around the globe, but that recklessness, I think, is something that can be destabilizing. And so I, looking at uh, those eight years of the Obama administration, I think the Biden, the Biden administration is going to follow some of those uh, parameters uh, and ground rules. But at the same time, I think the situation and the environment has changed markedly and particularly since uh, we have four years of the Trump administration. And I, I will agree with Bilahari that I, I think that there has been continuity uh, in large measure uh, between the Trump administration and Biden administration when it comes to China. Thankfully, we don't have a lot of those rhetorical broadsides uh, that are coming out of Washington. And so it's a quieter form of diplomacy and behind the scenes, which I think can be more effective. 
But uh, I do think we're still going to see a fair amount of, of tension between Beijing and Washington as they work through some of these very, very difficult and complex issues. Hello, Hari. Well, I don't want to get into a side debate and sidetrack this whole thing, right? I, I think uh, about how things were, what things were intended and how they were perceived. But there are other examples. You know, the point is, I think, here, uh, our, our main interest in, in, in Southeast Asia, in East Asia generally, was the South China Sea, the Senkakus, the Taiwan Straits. Uh, and whether intended or not, there was a perception of reluctance, not weakness, right? reluctance to uh, call out the Chinese, or there was a debate a very public debate about where about four knobs and so on. I'll give you one more example, and I'll just move on to make a slightly different point. Mr. Xi Jinping went to Sunnylands and promised not to militarize the South China Sea. Uh, a direct promise from one head of state to another head of state. I think that was 2015 or, or thereabouts. And he went right back and did almost the exact opposite with no particular response. And the whole region drew certain conclusions from it, rightly or wrongly, never mind. Now, um, but uh, that's past, and I think uh, Mr. Biden is not going to make those mistakes because I think all friends and allies in our region, including some former treaty allies of the United States, made it clear. What is, I think, now our concern, there is a huge missing piece in the American approach towards uh, Indo-Pacific, shall we call it now, right? And that is trade policy. Mr. Trump, for whatever reason, made a huge mistake when he pulled the, China, uh, pulled the United States out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, in this region where I live, trade is strategy. Right? You need that peace. I understand that domestic politics is not conducive to it. I understand the difficulties, but you need to at least signal that you are Thinking about it, and when uh, times are more proprietous, you will try to do something. Not necessarily rejoin the TPP. I think that's going to be very difficult, right? But craft some kind of trade approach because that is a huge missing piece in your approach to the Indo-Pacific. Can, can we stay on the trade issue for a second? Yeah. Because that was such a big part of the Trump administration's um, attitude approach towards China, right? Get tough on China, quote, um, you know, tariffs, sanctions, um, that, 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 you know, he, his argument, of course, was that the United States for too long uh, had been being pushed around on the trade front by China, and it was time to get tough. I'm wondering what your, after, um, you know, four years of it, are there things, are there aspects of the Trump approach towards trade that you think that the Biden administration should adopt? Well, look, you know, I think the Trump administration, or Mr. Trump himself and some of his uh, trade advisors, huh, confuse two different things, right? They confuse certain grievances the United States, and not just the United States, many countries had against certain Chinese uh, trade and economic policies, which, were, which created a less than level playing field, and this multilateral trade uh, pact called the TPP. Now, the TPP wasn't a, a traditional free trade agreement. It actually was intended and, uh, to set standards for the next generation of industries. And who was, which country could benefit from most of those standards? The United States. So it was a squandered opportunity because he didn't quite understand these things. All right? I don't think he understood at all. And he had people like Peter Navarro and all that you know, who had, shall we say, very eccentric attitudes towards trade. Uh, since the 1980s. At that time, it was Japan, now it's China, all right? right? So I think it was botched, completely botched. And I knew there were other people in the Trump administration who didn't share these views, but you know they were, they were the minority and they perhaps wisely shut up. Now, I think, look, it is quite clear there are certain Chinese behaviors in the economic field that, may, that many countries find unacceptable. It's not just the United States. In fact, I think you will be hard pressed to find any G7 economy that doesn't have similar concerns. Not everybody has the same concerns or holds them with the same intensity, but nobody is without concerns about certain Chinese economic policies, not just trade, uh, 
and, and, they, uh, and that's a fact. Uh, that's why if there is a kind of incipient coalition of countries with concerns about China, it was not the creation of Mr. Trump, it's the creation of Mr. Xi Jinping. <laughs> uh, so they are there, they have to be dealt with. I listened to uh, Ms. Tai's uh, speech on Monday about trade policy, right? And she basically said, I'm going to tweak it on the edges. Wisely, she said, let's not uh, that she made it clear that this idea of decoupling, which was ridiculous in the first place, is, is not there because you can't decouple. Huh? Uh, but I am going to try to have to deal with these problems because they are not gone away. These problems were not Mr. Trump's invention. They have been there for some time. The American business community's attitudes towards China was hardening, hardening and souring at least since the time of Bush 43. I happen to know that myself, right? But the Chinese missed it, and they botched the, they, they also botched their approach, their policy to us in the United States. Now, they have to be dealt with. You can't just sweep this under the table. Everybody is going to be more careful about China. Nobody is going to ever neglect China. And that brings me to one more point, and, and then I'll shut up for this time, right? Look, uh, the US, we are clearly in a new period of US-China strategic competition. This is often being called a new Cold War. I think this is an extremely misleading and intellectually lazy trope. Now, the US-Soviet competition during the Cold War was essentially between two systems. And the competition was det to determine which system would prevail. But the US and China are both vital, irreplaceable parts of a single global system, connected to each other in ways that the Soviet Union and, and uh, US were never connected. The competition between the US and China is not competition between two systems, it's competition within a system to see which will dominate the system. And that's a fundamentally different type of competition. It's a much more complicated type of competition. Complicated for both the principles, the US and China, and for third countries. Because we are all connected, and the connection is part of the insecurities everybody feels, but, and we cannot decouple. I don't believe we can totally decouple. Partially here and there maybe, but not totally. And that's fundamentally different competition. Just one example, and I promise I'll shut up for now, right? Uh, for some reason, the Chinese have a huge vulnerability is on semiconductors. The US or, it, or its allies and friends hold very vital parts of the semiconductor supply chain in their hands. But at the same time, China is 40% of the semiconductor market, global semiconductor market. You can't possibly cut off 40% of a market without hurting your own companies or the companies of your friends and allies. So that makes the, the competition much more complex. And, and that's why I think Mr. Trump's approach to trade was not wrong in its goals, in the sense that he wanted to create a more level playing field not just for American companies, for all other companies, but the methods he, he adopted to go about it and the chaotic nature of his administration uh, it was not helpful at all. And hopefully we'll now see a more coherent, directed, deliberate method of dealing with these problems because the problems are there, they're not gonna go away. I think if you, uh, if you took any aspect of uh, Trump's uh, behavior and foreign policy um, and said Trump's policy towards blank was chaotic, um, it would be, you'd have many uh, 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 different options um, on that front. John, I wanted to, to sort of get you to talk on the, the broad U.S.-China um, relationship. Uh, Bilahari talks about, you know, on one hand, this great power competition that has existential um, questions around it, um, but yet it's not a Cold War as it it was with the Soviet Union. Um, and I wanted to, um, he laid out sort of some of the different aspects of the relationship. I want to see how, how you see that. And well, I, I share um, some, but not all of Bilahari's uh, sentiments and views on this. Um, yeah, if you look back in the US-China relationship, especially over the last 20 years, I mean, we have seen this growing power and muscularity of China on many fronts on the trade, business, commercial, um, digital, uh, and military front. 
And so it's been this slow creeping movement that has gained, I think, momentum over the last certainly uh, half dozen more years. Uh, and so I think we're in agreement in terms of what the challenges and the problems are. Um, but when, and I understand what Bill Harry is saying when we're all part of this interconnected global system. And certainly given the extent of the, the trade and business and commercial uh, interactions between the United States and China, we are part of that global system. At the same time, though, I think that China and the United States represent two different approaches, certainly, to how to carry out uh, governance responsibilities and how to pursue objectives on that global stage. Uh, China is an autocratic country. Uh, the United States, and I think the Biden administration has tried to emphasize that there are real differences between democratic countries and autocratic systems of government. And so as I look back over the last several years, and clearly, Washington has had to cope not just with the China challenge, but also on the domestic front uh, to include on things like TPP. Uh, and I agree with Bill Hari that we, it was a, a lost opportunity on the part of the United States. Uh, during my last year or two of as being CIA director, I traveled out to East Asia, Singapore and other countries, and there was a real pleading uh, for the United States to be able to push forward with TPP as a way to provide a counterweight to that very hot Chinese breath bearing down on the necks of the countries in the region. And so uh, unfortunately, uh, we were not able to pursue that TPP because of that domestic political environment. Now that's one of the messy aspects of our democracy. You have these competing interests and different ideological perspectives. And I do think that some of the goals of the various administrations have been similar. But I, as, as Bill Hari points out, when you have a Peter Navarro advising Donald Trump, I mean, his goals and objectives were quite extreme in terms of trying to ensure that it was not just going to be uh, beneficial to American interests, but I think there was a real effort to try to undercut and undermine Chinese uh, interests at the same time. But when I look at China's Belt and Road Initiative, which has been very, very, I think, strategic and clever in many respects in terms of how it has pursued this, China has the benefit, and Xi Jinping, I think, is a strategic thinker, China has the benefit of having continuity in its policy approach because it doesn't have to deal with election cycles and different administrations and a lot of different players that come in and out. And so the, the concern I have is that the United States, it, it's difficult for the United States to pursue a, a thoughtful, uh, durable um, policy over the course of time to deal with a strategic challenge such as China because of the political environment in Washington, not just in terms of uh, the administrations will flip from Republican to Democratic and you'll have different individuals in the White House, but also the Congress. And even though I think there's strong uh, consensus in the Congress about the nature of the threat posed by China, and there's, we all tend to have a, an easy time to admire the problem of China, it's much more challenging and difficult to come up with the appropriate approach that um, tries to confront China without pushing the envelope too much and get into active conflict. And so I, I do think that the challenge for the Biden administration, as it was for the Obama administration, is to decide how forceful to be with China. I mean, there was an effort in the Obama administration to ensure the freedom of navigation in the, the, the Southeast Asia waters in the South China Sea. And U.S. naval uh, ships uh, were confronting uh, the Chinese, and despite some of their calls for you know, no U.S. naval maneuvers in areas that they claim were within their territorial waters. Uh, so it, it's a delicate uh, balance that has to be struck. I think as we've mentioned before, you need to um, demonstrate a, a toughness that you're not going to um, concede to uh, the other. At the same time, uh, I think in light of the many different um, levers that China can pull, including on that digital front, uh, you have to be mindful of the actions that you take and what type of reaction it's going to uh, cause on, on the other side. Can I, I want something to what Ms. Sure, absolutely. Can I say? Look, you know, I think um, strategically, the U.S. has been pretty consistent. Um, 
Ever since the end of the Vietnam War, you have been very consistent in a strategic role as the offshore balancer in East Asia. Right. Tactically, let's not talk about that because administration change, people change, circumstances change. But as the offshore balancer, you have been very consistent for almost 50 years. Right? Uh, however, as the offshore balancer, you face a fundamental problem. It's very difficult to get the temperature of your porridge exactly right. It's always going to be too hot to some and too cold to others. In other words, you're always going to cause fears of entanglement if you are too forceful, or you're going to uh, evoke fears of abandonment if you are too passive and it's, you can't please everybody all the time. Right? Uh, but that's just you. And yes, uh, uh, absolutely, I agree. The challenge, the domestic challenges are greater than in the United States than I've ever seen in the 40 years or so I've had to deal with the United States, right? But I always take consolation from one fact which I realized when I was a student in the United States a long time ago, right? That the most important things about the United States do not happen in Washington, DC. I know people who live in Washington, DC don't agree, but the most important things in the United States, the most essential, creative, resilient parts of the United States are on Wall Street, in American corporations, in American universities, on main streets of the 50 states, not in Washington, D.C. And that is the essential strength and resilience of the United States. So I think um, we've got to get through this period um, with, of more than usual domestic tension, not domestic concern. But I have, uh, I'm quite, I'm quite um, confident that you will. I was just in Washington, D.C. about a month ago, right? And uh, yeah, about a month ago now when Afghanistan and the whole mess in Afghanistan was, was playing itself out. And all my friends kept telling me, what does this mean? Are we reliable? What do you think? Do you think of us as reliable? And my reply was, I have never thought of you as reliable. However, you are essential. That's a different question. So whether you're reliable or it's a bit moot, you know, we'll have to adapt to you one way or the other. It is now a better understanding in Southeast Asia in particular, although not everybody will be prepared to say so publicly, that in order to have a good relationship with China and preserve some measure of autonomy, you need a US presence and you need to have a good relationship or a stable relationship with the United States. It's not a choice. In fact, one depends on the other. Nobody can ignore China, nobody wants to, but the the necessary condition for being able to develop relations with China without losing autonomy is to have the U.S. around and to develop your own strong relations with the U.S. There's a better understanding of this. I, I give you one example, right? In 90, towards the end of the 1980s, a combination of uh, Filipino domestic politics and natural disaster forced the U.S. out of Subic Bay and uh, Clark Airfield. And Singapore has never been shy about saying that uh, the U.S. has to be present offered the use of our facilities. It's not a substitute for either Clark or Subic, but it's better to have at least some small presence than no presence. And in 1990, we signed an MOU to that effect. Our neighbors reacted as if we had conspired with the United States to, to, to kidnap their firstborn and sell their firstborn into slavery. It was a hysterical reaction, right? However, in 2005, we signed a far more reach, far reaching strategic partnership framework agreement with the United States, providing for far more far reaching uh, defense and security cooperation, not a whimper. And in 2019, we renewed the MOU that allowed you to use the use, the use of our facilities. Nobody even noticed. And the difference is there is that better appreciation of the role of the United States in our region. It's not a choice between the US or China. In, or we have to do both, right, simultaneously. In fact, one is the condition for the other. And that's what, um, uh, that is a fundamental change. So um, we, we have about 10 or 15 minutes left and we have a, a fair amount I still wanted to cover. Um, Bel Belhari just um, raised uh, um, an issue that I wanted to, to discuss. Um, which is Afghanistan and uh, the fallout of the messy American uh, pullout of a, an, an, an ending of a 20-year war. And, and I have questions for both of you. The first is, 
you're going back to this original concept of, of the transition from counterterrorism to great uh, power politics, however you want to describe it. Um, you know, the, the Biden administration's um, interim national security strategy, you know, definitely envisioned um, this, you know, this kind of transition, more of a focus on Russia and China, less of the laser focus on counterterrorism that's happened for 20 years. Um, I'm wondering, John, if, if um, you think, you know, history might have gotten in the way of this a little bit, uh, given what we saw in Afghanistan, the rapid collapse of the Afghan government and the Afghan military uh, after the United States left, um, what intelligence officials talk about the, the, the rising threats, not of, um, you know, not only of Al Qaeda and affiliates, but uh, ISIS affiliates, um, whether it's just not going to be that easy. And, you know, the United States is once again going to find itself, no matter how hard it tries to, you know, shift its focus, um, you know, still um, with this, um, you know, being anchored down to focusing and being worried about uh, terror networks and terror threats. And then, Bilhari, um, your my question to you is about um, the view of the Afghanistan uh, withdrawal, um, how it transpired um, in your region, how the Chinese see it uh, in your view, and and what do you think? How do you think they see it's going to impact you know America's decision about um, how it engages with the world? Well, I think for the counterterrorism programs of the United States, uh, the, it's been clear over the last decade and more that there has been a dispersal of terrorist uh, capabilities, resources, uh, threats uh, throughout the, the broader Middle East, North Africa area. And so with the very troubling, uh, unfortunate, uh, messy withdrawal of U.S. presence in Afghanistan, U.S. military contractors and intelligence assets, what the United States is doing now is trying to ensure that there's going to be a capability in that region that we can still um, leverage if there is a need to strike out against the terrorist uh, enclaves or capabilities uh, inside of Afghanistan, working with the Pakistanis, even though that's very frustrating, as I know personally. Uh, but it's, I would see that if there's going to be a regrowth of terrorist elements inside of Afghanistan, it is going to take a while. I do think the Taliban are going to be focused on trying to destroy as much of ISIS-K inside of Afghanistan as possible. I think the Taliban also are interested in trying to restart some of the uh, relationships with the international community because of their pressing financial economic uh, needs. And so I do not believe that they're going to just be welcoming in uh, the terrorist organizations. Um, and there are many other parts of the, the globe in that region where terrorists are able to operate, I think, with the even greater sort of independence and, and autonomy. We, you look at, at Yemen and Syria, inside of Iraq, uh, Somalia, uh, across North Africa. So uh, I, I do believe that uh, there is an adjustment that the United States is going to need to make as a result of a lack of that presence in Afghanistan. But uh, the, the United States counterterrorism community has a, a wide array of, of technical capabilities and others that I think will allow us to at least monitor any type of regeneration of terrorist uh, activities in that area. And I, I would caution people to not overinterpret uh, what the, the message is of U.S. pullout from Afghanistan. President Biden has been a long proponent of reducing and then eliminating our military presence there. And so it should come as no surprise to, to folks that he followed through on that. Uh, but um, in terms of other global commitments, um, what I am more concerned about um, is how much that domestic uh, environment in Washington and throughout the United States is going to uh, demand that uh, the Biden administration focuses uh, on these domestic issues um, and hopefully not at the expense of our global responsibilities. And, and this is where I think Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken and others are going to have to work very carefully with President Biden to ensure that the United States fulfills its broad array of responsibilities on that global stage, not just on counterterrorism, but as we've been talking about, great power competition and other things, um, and that there's going to be at least uh, some support within the Congress uh, to allow the United States to pursue 
um, the policies that are going to not just protect our own national interests abroad, but also try to contribute to peace, stability, and security around the globe. I do, I do want to get to this dom domestic issue uh, that you bring up um, in, in a few minutes, because I think it's very important. Uh, Bill Hari, on the Afghanistan question, I wanted to get your, your, uh, your insight. Well, I think it was the right thing to draw down your gr ground presence in Afghanistan and get out. I didn't see that was any vital American national interest involved. The terrorism threat will always be there. It may go up after some time, as John said, because it may become a safe ha haven again, but you have a whole array of capabilities to be able to deal with that without getting involved in what I think was a fool's errand, trying to create a nation where there never has been one in Afghanistan. So you're better out off. I mean, the specific operation of getting out could have been perhaps uh, better executed, but I don't want to second guess people. It was a difficult situation anyway, but it's done, right? That's one phase over. You still have to deal with terrorism, but you can deal with it in a different way. We all have to deal with terrorism, right? It's never going to go away. Now, you ask a question about uh, who gains and who loses, right? I think that was the import of your question about China, right? I don't think China is overjoyed at you leaving Afghanistan because China does have a lot of very important interests. It's adjacent to Xinjiang. The East Turkestan Islamic um, Front, I can't remember the exact name, is, was in, was in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, there's a Xinjiang separationist movement. Uh, the Chinese have cut all kinds of deals with Taliban. And if they really believe that the Taliban are going to be able to keep it, um, uh, well, good luck to them. Because I don't think, I think the Taliban will soon be as incoherent as every other central authority in, has, ever, has always been in, in Afghanistan. And that is going to be a great problem to countries who are Afghanistan's neighbors. But it's not a United States problem, it shouldn't be yours. You are still there in the region. US Navy is in Bahrain, US Air Force is in Qatar. You are moving to a posture that you moved to in East Asia half a century ago almost, that is being the offshore balancer. You can intervene or not intervene when your interests are affected and you have a whole array of instruments to, to intervene. So I don't see that you are going to be the loser for it in the long run. In fact, you, you will be stronger. I agree with John that your basic challenges, and I think Mr. Biden has said so, has, you have to make America stronger domestically in order to play the kind of role many countries want you to play internationally. These are not alternatives. One is the foundation of the other. John, I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, a region you're very familiar with, um, given your in your your career trajectory, and that's and that and that's the Middle East, and and, and more specifically, um, the you know there's this maybe it's optimism always that the United States is going to, you know, disengage from the Middle East or spend less time worrying about the Middle East. And presidents have long tried to do it and um, usually have failed because, you know, the Middle East um, inevitably draws the United States um, in, in, in different capacities. Um, but we've seen a real, um, you know, interesting trans transition of sorts in the Middle East um, over time, uh, where you've seen, um, you know, a lot of the Sunni um, uh, countries, the Gulf countries, uh, drawing closer uh, to Israel with, with the Abraham Accords at the end of the Trump administration, um, kind of a realignment uh, against Iran, um, which um, certainly happened before the uh, Trump administration, uh, but it was accelerated in part during the Trump administration. And I'm wondering sort of your view on um, on how that how that continues. Is that is this um, a sort of inevitability now where we're going to look at the Middle East in 10 or 15 years and see, you know, basically an alliance between Israel, Saudi Arabia, um, Qatar, the UAE, Bahrain uh, against Iran uh, and, you know, Shia Muslim world? Or, um, or do you think it's going to be sort of messier than that? Well, I think the... Uh contacts, relationships between Israel and some of the Sunni Arab states have been underway for a number of years. I think during the Trump administration and the Abraham Accords, it was made public and formalized, which 
I think it's a good thing in terms of having those state to state relationships so that they can be channels of communication, dialogue, discussion. Uh, I am concerned that uh, those steps were taken, I think, at the expense of Palestinian interests. And uh, the Palestinians are no closer to a homeland uh, than they were before. And I think it's one of the tragic failures in the Middle East. And I'm hoping that the Biden administration will continue to encourage these types of Israeli Arab contacts and relationships, but not neglect the Palestinian uh, in terms of a, a potential two state solution. Now, I do think a lot of the states in the Middle East do react to uh, who is in the White House at any particular time. And so some of the developments we saw during the Trump administration took into account that it was Donald Trump who was in the White House. But since Joe Biden was elected, I think we also see some movements uh, that aligns with some of the Biden administration's priorities such as the Saudis and the Emiratis have been much less um, hostile toward Iran. And even uh, discussions are underway about an improvement of relationships there. Uh, I do think that was in, in anticipation that the, uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iranian nuclear accord, was going to be reconstituted. Now, I think that has run into some challenges, particularly since the hardliners in Iran um, have, are now ascendant. And with the uh, Raisi uh, recently elected, as president, I think there is concern that uh, there's not going to be a uh, interlocutor in, in Iran that is going to be conducive to uh, bringing some of the, these tensions down and reconstituting that Iran nuclear agreement. But I, I do think that we continue to see the evolution within the Middle East um, of their, their politics, their relationships with each other. Um, they adapt to new realities. Uh, I am concerned that the uh, increasing um, suffering of, of so many individuals in places like Syria and in Yemen, Libya, Iraq. Uh, these are things that I think the United States can work with these countries to see whether or not we can alleviate some of those hardships without encouraging any of those oppressive and repressive policies. And then finally, I think obviously with Mohammed Salman uh, as the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia um, and the um, the need to be able to ensure that, uh, that there's not going to be any repetition of that horrific murder and dismemberment of Gamal, uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, by, by the Saudis. Um, I, I do think that the Biden administration needs to be tough uh, with MBS um, uh, because there still are a number of oppressive and repressive practices going on inside of the kingdom. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, given the distractions in Washington, I'm hoping that there is going to be an enlightened and in a engaged uh, U.S. Uh, activity within the, the Middle East, because it's an area that you cannot neglect, because if you do neglect it, I think it's going to, to bite you. Are you disappointed that thus far the, the Biden administration um, has um, not uh, uh, specifically uh, um, uh, singled out MBS um, uh, for criticism uh, in its in its uh, you know Saudi policy so far. I mean, there was critical, obviously, of the Khashoggi killing, but uh, no action was taken directly about MBS. Are you disappointed by that? Yes, I am. I think that the Biden administration should have been uh, taking a harder line. They could have said that MBS is not going to be granted any official meetings. Uh, he's not going to be able to visit Washington. I think there are things that uh, we need to do to hold the individual responsible um, and accountable uh, for the, the death of uh, Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, now, I know that there are senior level and high level discussions. So Jake Sullivan was out there uh, recently. Uh, Bill Burns is out there. I, I do think it's important to have that dialogue. Saudi Arabia is a very important country in the Middle East. Uh, and we need to ensure that there's going to be um, a, a strong relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. But I think until we effectively address the Khashoggi killing, uh, it's going to uh, be a challenging, I think, for uh, President Biden to just uh, dismiss uh, the, uh, the responsibility of, of MBS uh, for that uh, killing. Uh, well, I have about 15 or 20 more questions. Unfortunately, I'm told uh, we have no time left. Um, and so I guess that's a sign of a, of a good discussion. We, we, we only got to about half of, 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 of what we could have, but um, uh, I thank both of you for a uh, enlightening discussion, a wide ranging discussion, and um, hopefully next year we will all be gathering in Doha together. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Bahari. Thank you, John.